get started. Uh, this is the first hour of today. I'm going to start in on chapter 8. I've got some review stuff um, for things coming up related to chapters 5 through 7, which is what the, the test tomorrow is on. Hope everybody's feeling okay. Um, just to look on the My Lab and Mastering Physics on Friday, there is a homework due on uh, chapter 8 stuff. Uh, I've also posted some chapter 8 videos. There's my voice in the next room. Hello, side room. Um, there is the return of Buzz Cut Guy, who has uh, doing static equilibrium problems. He's also uh, walks the plank. So what you can see here is a plank with a mass on one end and a table, and he goes off the end of the table. This is something I haven't been brave enough to do. But then you can see, see how that ends if you check that out. And there are also two of these Khan Academy style uh, videos where we work through chapter eight like problems. Okay. I want to start with a little review of uh, rolling without skidding, which is something that came up in chapter five. And there was a question, problem five, Point 11, I guess, from the fifth homework, which was asking to determine the speeds of point A, B, and C with respect to the ground for a bicycle that's moving at a constant speed of four meters per second. It asks you to uh, determine, and then also to determine the same speed of those points relative to the bicycle. So it's two different frames of reference. Dog cam's working? All right. Thank you, Pius. We're cooking along. So this is the way I think of it. Um, you've got uh, a, a thing that's rolling without slipping. The wheel, we're going to say, is rotating counterclockwise. And we're going to say that a tangential speed of any point on the, on the rim relative to the axle is this four meters per second. Uh, and without, when rolling without skidding, what goes on is that the axle moves at that same speed. So whatever the VT is, that tangential speed of points on the, the rim of the wheel relative to the axle, if it's rolling without skidding, that also happens to be the velocity of the axle relative to the ground, or the speed of the axle relative to the ground. And so what you have is sort of two reference frames. You have uh, the, I guess, the ground frame where it's, it's rolling along, and you have the axle frame. So the way I look at this is in the, uh, I guess, the bicycle frame or the axle frame, you've got the way the vectors look is uh, this one, its tangential speed is to the left. So you can kind of draw that arrow like that. This tangential speed is down. This tangential speed is to the right, and this tangential speed is up. So you can picture that. I think I have a bicycle wheel here, which is that it's just simply rotating around like that. That's in the frame of the axle. So the points here are moving down, points here are moving to the right, and points here are moving to the left. And now you take those four vectors, or whatever vector you want, and in order to translate it, or get it into the, I guess, get it rolling, you move the entire object along at four meters per second. So you add four meters per second to all of those vectors. Um, the top one goes to, I guess, eight, eight meters per second. This one is, you're adding these two kind of uh, perpendicular vectors, so it's going down and to, to the right. This one is v equals zero. And this one, I guess, is going up and to the left, is sort of going this direction, some sort of diagonal there, with the square root of four squared plus four squared or something. So that's how it goes. And um, so the way I did it there, point in, I sort of did it the opposite way, the, in the axle frame, Point C is going four meters to, per second to the left. The axle is at rest, and point A is moving four meters per second to the right. Uh, but when you add that linear motion, point C now is going eight meters per second to the left. The axle, which was stationary in the axle frame, is now going four meters per second to the left. That's the speed of the bike. And the bottom part is at rest. So it just means that if this bike is moving along, 
<laughs> You've got uh, this, oh, I see the chain. Um, this bottom point, as at the moment it touches the ground, it is at rest. And that's sort of the reason why you've got this static friction always acting on these uh, rolling without skidding. Okay. Um, so in rolling without skidding, point A, which touching the ground, has a moment, momentary velocity of zero, and that's where the static friction comes from. And I have a little animation, which I'll show, um, of a point rolling on a disk. So it's going to take the motion diagram view of that point on the rim. So it's laying down one dot every specific every in, um, duration of time, equal durations of time. So if the dots are far spaced apart, that means it's going faster. As it's getting, the dots are getting closer and closer together, that means that this point is slowing down. And it slows down, slows down, and slows down, and slows down, and slows down until for a moment it is at rest when it hits the ground and then it gets picked up again and dragged along. So that's called rolling without skidding. Uh, so, yeah, no matter how fast your car is going, you can be going 100 kilometers an hour on the road, but there are four points on your car that are at rest, which is the bottoms of those four tires. But I guess the tops of those four tires are going at 200 kilometers an hour, so, yes? Since the center moves forward towards three centimeters, how can it know the displacement for the other two points? Well, I guess that's kind of complicated. Like if you've got a wheel and it rolls along, th those objects, the points on the wheel are all doing those kind of curved paths, right? Yeah, there's so, the addition of the three centimeters and the, uh, another factor, but I don't know how you calculate that. Yeah, neither do I. But I know that the instantaneous velocity is very easy to calculate. So at, at points A and B and, and C. The instantaneous velocity of the axle, if it's three centimeters per second, for example, at an instant, then that means at that instant, the bottom is instantaneously zero. As it rolls along, you're right, all the points kind of do a complicated thing, don't they? But the instantaneous velocities actually turn out to be very, very easy to compute. Yes? So back to rolling without skidding, uh, another way that I try to visualize this, because I think it is a little hard to imagine that as this wheel is going along, that the point at the bottom is really at rest. But I kind of think of it as if the, if the tire was flat, or if maybe if you were a tank rolling along, you would be rolling along and sort of laying down tread at the front. And there might even be like spikes in the, in the tank tread that dig into the ground. And then the tank rolls over it as they're stuck in the ground. And, then at, and the, at the end, it picks up those spikes again. So it's a sort of the same sort of thing, but only in a small little area here. It hits the ground, it sort of sinks in, and then it picks it up again on the back. And it's, it's really crucial, because the force of static friction is so much greater than the force of kinetic friction, and that's why cars work. And that's why, also, if you ever get stuck in the snow with your car, and you're trying to utilize that friction between rubber and snow, which is already pretty low, if you start spinning your wheels, and you hear them going, or you see someone doing that, that's the wrong thing, because that's using the kinetic friction. And the coefficient of kinetic friction is always less than the coefficient of static friction. So what you have to do is you have to kind of try to roll your way out of it. Just, just go a little bit until you roll a bit and then let yourself kind of roll back and then try to hit, it, hit the gas just a little bit to get out. As soon as you hit the gas too much and your wheel starts spinning, then you're down to kinetic friction and that's not good. So to try to rock yourself sort of out of your, out of your situation. So let's do a learning catalytics question. You're sitting in your car, you step on the gas, and the whole car accelerates forward. This is requiring a large forward force on the car. That's the external force upon the car. So if you've got F1 on 2, you could say 1 or 2 is the car. What's 1? Yeah, so yes, that's right. So it's the static friction. So once again, it's rolling without skidding. So somehow that static friction that, uh, that is on the road. And, and one, like one way, again, for me to remember that it's friction at all is that if you, uh, if you were on ice, like a frictionless surface, and you stepped on the gas in the car, the engine would rotate the wheels, but you wouldn't actually move. So I guess the engine's doing something. What the engine is actually doing is it's providing a torque to the axle, which is then rotating the wheels. And then it's up to the static friction of the road to really get that car moving.
Okay, so the static friction sort of provides a constraint, which is that the bottoms of the wheels of the tires don't, don't skid. And that's what, that's what causes you to accelerate. Okay. So, so once again, um, actually we can just take a look, quick look at where we're going here. Is, uh, whoop. <laughs> if this is your book, you are somewhere, so that's Physics 131. We've gone through all these first uh, seven chapters. We've got the next two chapters, which are on uh, extended bodies at rest and rotational motion. So this is all the torque stuff, things that are turning. And then we've got two more chapters before the final exam, which is vibrational motion and mechanical waves. So we're going to talk about things that are oscillating back and forth and then how that translates into things that can, like sound waves and, and electromagnetic waves like light. And that's the, that's the plan. <laughs> so the big idea here is uh, so far we've been talking about uh, objects using the point particle model. We've ignored the fact that they have size and shape. This chapter, we're going to start treating objects as extended bodies or rigid bodies or something. And the difference here is that when you draw the force diagram, instead of drawing a point with all the forces going off the point, now you have to draw, usually it's like a rectangle, and then you draw the, the forces not just going away from the rectangle, but they're attached to the rectangle where the, you think the forces act on the, the object. I'll give you some examples of that today. So we're still, all these things about force and momentum, acceleration, uh, are still important, but now we have some new things. So there's this new physical quantity called torque. And I said at the, at the beginning slide, rhymes with fork. It's, you know, got this ridiculous spelling. But it's kind of like a force, but it's how, it's how a force can turn something. So a force can be used to turn something, and there's a, it has different units than force, but it's called a torque, which turns stuff. And you also have rotation, okay? Things can rotate. And one of the fun things, it's, there's a lot of not, ob not obvious stuff. Can I hook this up to here? Yeah, I can. So when things can rotate, you have things like angular momentum. I don't know if you've ever played with little gyroscopes or something, but they can be pretty tricky. Thank you. <laughs> don't know what I'd do without you, Pius. Okay, thanks. So what you do, I don't know if anyone can see this, but if you've got a wheel and you pick it up like this and I let it go, what do you think is going to happen? Prediction? <laughs> it's going to fall, right? <laughs> it falls down. Okay, but what if I get it spinning and then let it go? So now it's got a whole bunch of angular momentum. If I let it go, prediction? Well, no one would have ever saw that coming. <laughs> it's just sort of spinning around. It's, it's what it's called is doing its precessing. So the gravitational torque is changing the angular momentum, but only by a little amount. And it actually changes it in this, this weird horizontal direction. So it's tricky, um, and it requires some, some different ideas. OK. And again, I have no idea if that got caught in the video. It's probably behind a bunch of people. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, YouTube. A rigid body is made as a model for an extended object. So here's some people. Um, we assume that the object has non-zero size, but the distances between all the individual parts of the object are fixed. So the size and shape of the object do not change. But it can rotate. Or it can accelerate. And so we have this idea of center of mass. So I think I had those little crazy shapes somewhere. Are they over on the counter back there? <laughs> yeah. My little kids' toys. I just wanted to show some ideas of uh, what she was doing in the, um, the textbook author. When you're pushing these objects with a pencil, and I think you will be doing this in practical if you haven't already. If you take like a hexagon like that, for example, and you're pushing it along, does anyone know what that is? If you push it not along the center of mass, it rotates. If you push it right along the center of mass, along a line that goes through the center of mass, then it doesn't rotate. And the same with different various shapes. Again, you push it side. You miss the center of mass, it rotates. If you hit it right through the center, you can push it along without rotating it. 
can see I went through my kid's toy box and grabbed all kinds of things. Also, if you pull it along the center of mass, it tends to want to, I guess, find, the center of mass wants to drag behind it. So I think this, you can find the center of mass that way as well. Whoop. Anyway, hours of fun. Okay. So that, so the idea is when I apply a force to an object, if that force passes through the center of mass, for some reason it doesn't rotate. The torque ends up being zero. Sometimes you have a fixed axis of rotation which might not be the center of mass. The best common example of that is actually a door. If you have a door and it's got some hinges on it, that door is kind of constrained to rotate around the hinge. So you've got this vertical line at the end of the door that it can kind of rotate in a circle around, maybe not a full circle, but it can swing around. And so to open a door, you need to apply a torque, in fact. How do you do that? Easy. You just apply a force. Um, but different forces give different torques. And even the same force applied in a different way can give a different torque. So you need to have uh, an axis of rotation. And then the three factors that affect the turning ability of a force, or the torque, I guess, is the place where the force is exerted, how much force you're using, and the direction in which the force is exerted. Where's our tech guy? Hi. Hey. <laughs> um, so I got a, another question. These folks will. Let's finish this one up. Going once, going twice. I think most people did get this one. It's got a kind of an intuitive answer, doesn't it? which is that, for some reason, this F1 works the best. Um, so the equation that you come up with is, whoops, go back, <laughs> is tau, which is the torque, is equal to plus or minus. The plus or minus is determining whether this thing is clockwise or counterclockwise, which is kind of interesting. Uh, we'll talk more about that later times F times L times sine theta. So these are all written together, but you're actually multiplying three things, the same three things that you were taking into consideration before. Magnitude of the force, L is the distance between the point where the force is exerted on the object and the axis of rotation. So the further away from the hinge you push the door, the more torque you're producing. If you push it right at the hinge, that doesn't do anything. And then there's this angle theta. Theta is the angle that the force makes relative to a line connecting the axis of rotation to the point where the force is exerted. Meaning that if you take a door and you just push on the end of it towards the hinge, it doesn't open the door. You have to push sideways to that direction. And so theta is exactly that. It's the angle between the, the direction of your force and the direction to the axis. So if it's zero, then the torque is zero if you're pointing right towards it. If you point your force perpendicular to that line towards the axis, you're going to rotate it, right? So you need theta to be close to 90 degrees, which makes sine theta maximum. Questions about that? I think it might be easiest if we do a, uh, an example. I'm going to try to use this. See it? Maybe I'll zoom a little more. Louis uses a 20 centimeter long wrench to turn a nut. This is a little bit tilted. The wrench handle is tilted 30 degrees above the horizontal axis, and Louis uh, pulls straight down in the end with a force of 100 newtons. Calculate the torque. There's a question mark there. So the sketch that I have is, I think what I want to do is imagine that the nut is some sort of hexagon that we want are trying to turn. And we've got some sort of wrench. So this is like the rotation axis. Is the thing that we're trying to rotate. The nut, I guess. 
And this, 20 centimeters, is the, the length of the wrench. What, 20 centimeters? From here to here. So this line that I've drawn is the wrench. And then this force is applied at the end of the wrench. F equals 100 newtons. And it's straight down. And it's saying that the wrench handle is tilted 30 degrees above the horizontal. And the force is straight down. So uh, the, the represent mathematically or something, this torque is going to be plus or minus F times L times sine theta. Theta is the angle between uh, F and the line um, from, I guess, the force point where you're applying the force to the rotation axis. So if the force is down there and this is the line towards the rotation axis, it's this is theta right there. So in our case, if you extend this triangle along, then I guess that uh, uh, theta plus 30 equals the 90 degrees because of the interior, I guess, triangles or something. So theta is equal to 60 degrees in our case. Okay. So, and then the other thing that you need to know is that uh, a counterclockwise torque, I'll talk more about this in a minute, is uh, negative and clockwise, sorry, is positive, and clockwise is negative. So that's a, a sort of a historical tradition. In our case, so what you have to do is think about if you're applying that force and it was the only force on it, which direction would the object rotate? So I think it's uh, clockwise. Okay, it would, go, it would go down, right? But it would, that's a clockwise rotation. So this means that this is a negative torque. So you say that to torque is equal to minus 100 newtons times 0 0.20 uh, meters, that's your L, 20 centimeters, times the sine of 60 degrees. And you just type that into your calculator and you get that it's negative 17.3. And the units are newtons times meters. Sine doesn't have a unit and so that's it. And then, I don't know, I'm getting paranoid about losing marks here, and I'm just say that I don't know how to evaluate this. <laughs> just so the marker knows that I thought about it. What's a 17.3 torque? I don't know. Newton meter? I guess it's hopefully good enough to turn the nut, but maybe it isn't, right? I don't know. <laughs> good enough. I'm not asking you guys to have some intuition about torques. How's everybody doing out there? Any questions? Yes? yes okay, can you repeat the question? Yes? No, you have to evaluate the answer, but that is an evaluation, which is that I, I don't know how to evaluate it. It's a statement that I've given up on evaluating, I guess. <laughs> if you just forget a step, right, and don't even think about it, then I think that's, that's possibly the marker might dock you, I guess. But if you say right out, how am I supposed to evaluate 17 Newton meters? It's not like I computed the height of the tower to be two millimeters. Then I would say, that sounds crazy or something, right? But if I evaluated the torque on a nut to be 17 Newton meters, <laughs> Okay. Good question. So once again, the SI unit of, uh, whoops, <laughs> I don't know this big typo there. The SI unit of force is the Newton. The SI unit of torque is the Newton meter. Okay. Random coincidence, that happens to be the unit of energy, but it's not at all related to energy. This, this distance is perpendicular, I guess, to the, to the force as opposed to parallel, anyway. And here's the sign convention once again. So if you have an object, I'll try to stand over there. 
and you, like a pencil, and you apply, if it's pointing towards the right and you are to the right of the axis of rotation, you push down, which way does it want to turn? It wants to turn this way, clockwise, so that's called a negative torque. Same pencil, but you push up on it, then that's uh, a positive torque. If you're pushing to the right of the axis of rotation. If you're pushing on a point which is to the left of the axis of rotation, it's kind of flipped. So you push down, that's actually making it go counterclockwise, that's called a positive torque. If you push up, then that's clockwise, that's a negative torque. Okay. Okay, let's do another uh, learning catalytics. Think about. these torques. You've got, so I want you to figure out if this is a positive or negative torque. A ladder is leaning against a wall. And the way I want you to think of this is you are looking at, I guess, sideways at this ladder. Okay, as viewed from this side, there are things that are going to be clockwise torques that want to rotate the la ladder clockwise. That would be called a negative torque. If it wants to rotate the ladder uh, <laughs> Whatever you got, right? If it wants to go counterclockwise, it's positive torque. Clockwise, that's a um, negative torque. The other way I try to remember that is I think about theta, right? If you are measuring theta from the x-axis towards the y-axis, does anyone ever know that in math? You go kind of up to, from x towards y. That's why counterclockwise is positive. You'd think it might be the other way around, right? But in math, since we go from x up to y, that's where it comes from. So, question. What's the sign of the torque of the normal force of the wall upon the ladder? This one up here. Is it positive or negative? Zero? Or it depends on where we choose the rotation axis to be. Yeah, so... <laughs> You can't, so, th so that's one of the rules of torque. Sometimes it's very obvious where the rotation axis is. If I take a wrench and I'm turning a bolt or something like that, the rotation axis is just the bolt, okay? Because it can just rotate around its axis. Or a door, the rotation axis is the hinge. In, these are called static equilibrium problems. It's actually not clear wh where the ladder might rotate around. And in fact, the ladder, as long as it's not slipping, it isn't rotating at all anyway. And so it turns out to be arbitrary where you choose the rotation axis. No matter where you choose the rotation axis, the torque, the net torque has to be zero anyways. So you can choose it wherever it's most convenient. So you, you have to choose it. <laughs> so that was the joke. Sorry. It's not a joke. It's true. You have to choose the rotation axis or define it if, you, if, if it's not simple. Come on. Now here's the real, real question. <laughs> Let's choose the rotation axis to be at the bottom of the ladder. <laughs> Maybe that's what you're thinking about. So let's give you one minute to think about this. Yeah, good. So uh, the, the normal force, you can draw it like that, I guess. The force of the wall on the ladder or something like that is to the right. Uh, if the rotation axis is down here, then that has a tendency to want to rotate it uh, clockwise, so that's a negative torque. Okay. Any questions? So the next point is that each force has its own torque. What we're going to do with static equilibrium problems, we'll talk about in the next hour, is that the same way if something is not accelerating, you add up all the forces, all the external forces, and set them to zero to put it into, I guess, equilibrium. We're going to do that exact same thing in these like rigid body things, but with torques. We're going to add up all the torques, some of which are positive, some of which are negative, and they're all going to sum to zero at the end if the thing is not, not rotating. So here's another force, the force of static friction of the floor and the ladder, which we hope is there. Usually there's a little foot or something, isn't there, so it doesn't slip out. First, you have to think about, first of all, which way is the static friction? And, and second of all, uh, once you know that, which way is it going to torque it? Yeah, so again, I'm, I'm messing with you. But okay, so let's, let's first of all, 
<laughs> Let's do a little review. Which way do you think the static friction force is? Does anyone actually think it, they, got, they got this? Which way is it? Does anyone want to volunteer? Just the force. Yes? Towards the left. That's correct. Why, why, why is it towards the left? So it doesn't slip to the right, I think. So the way I always think about static friction force is that whatever way the object wants to slip, then the static friction prevents it from slipping by, by pushing. So I think somehow if this was really slippery, woo, the wall <laughs> would, go, would go down out that way. That's the thing that I'm terrified of whenever I'm climbing up to, to clean my eaves. Anyway, so, so you can draw it right like that. But the problem is you've defined the rotation axis right there. So that distance between the force line and the rotation axis is zero. So this little L equals zero. Um, and number torque is equal to plus or minus F times L times sine theta. This L sometimes is called the moment, moment arm. It's the distance there. So if you're having a force that's right on the axis, there's no torque. And it's the same with the normal force, actually, from the, from the floor onto the, onto the ladder. Questions about that one? So this is actually getting a little weird, because there's the normal force of the floor on the ladder, also going to be zero torque. That, you're going to get a negative torque from the wall. You do have to balance the torque, so it's the whole thing is going to rotate. So there's got to be another torque. So, um, and this is getting into this whole gravity torque. So if I have, for example, this object, and I was to, to choose this to be the rotation axis and let it rotate, what do you think is going to happen to it? Oh, it's going to fall like that. You got it. So gravity somehow, what about if I hold it over here? <laughs> Whoop. So wait, gravity is, sometimes it's rotating it uh, clockwise, sometimes it's rotating, rotating it counterclockwise. That's a bit weird. So, where is the gravitational force exerted on a rigid body? Well, the, the true answer is it's exerted everywhere. Every particle is attracted downwards towards the center of the Earth. Um, but the, one of the reasons we compute the center of mass is because when you calculate the torque due to gravity, you are allowed to pretend as if all the mass was concentrated at the center of mass. So I like to think of it as that gravity comes up and hooks on to the center of mass and pulls there. <laughs> now, it's not real, really what's happening is it's pulling everywhere, but the, the net net is you can pretend, you can calculate the torque by, by putting it there. Okay. So sometimes it's just in the geometrical center, sometimes you have to compute where it is, but you can, um, and so it's sometimes called center of gravity. You can pretend the, the force is acting there and compute the torque from there, the gravitational torque. So that's the next learning catalytics question which is, again, same ladder. Choose the rotation axis to be the bottom of the ladder. What's the sign of the torque of the force of gravity of the Earth on the ladder? F sub G, E on L or something. Yeah, so, okay. So there's the force of gravity. It's not through the rotation axis. How is it going to rotate? It's going to rotate it uh, counterclockwise, so that's a positive torque. So what you've got is you've got the, the negative torque from the normal force of the wall on the ladder. And that's going to be equal and opposite to the gravity force, this mg, um, of the gravity torque uh, of the Earth on the ladder. Those will cancel each other out because the only other forces acting on the ladder are at your chosen rotation axis. So that, that forms your ability to actually compute what is the, the normal force, the sideways normal force of the, the ladder and the wall, which you can't do just with forces. If you don't have torques, you can never figure that out. So that's why that's useful. Any questions?